I went outside to get fresh air because I was sick to my stomach and I passed out and I fell over a ledge and I fell about 25 feet. My right leg was shattered. Um, I had back fractures. I was actually much later diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury. Around week four, my former husband came suitcases packed saying he no longer wished to be married. And even though I take full responsibility for my portion that contributed to that decision. You might agree that the timing wasn't exactly optimal, not that it ever is. And the real true blow came when we went to court. My former husband um, is an attorney and he was awarded full custody of our son who was only four and a half at that time. You're listening to the Woman of Value podcast. You are about to hear the story of a woman who is following her dreams and passions and creating positive change in the world. My guest today is Wendy Darling. She is the founder of the Miraculous Living Institute. She has over 40 years experience as a relationship and transformational results expert. She's a speaker, an author, a seminar facilitator, management and organizational development consultant, a master healer, and a coach. She has created a unique and innovative system called the Miraculous Living Method, and it allows you to get the results you want with greater ease and speed. And we're going to talk a little bit about that during the podcast today. Wendy also hosted two of her own podcasts and has been featured in Forbes, as well as many other publications. She is the number one best-selling author of a few books, um, Create Your Miraculous Life, It Is Never Too Late, and The Miracle That Is Your Life, two books. Wendy's clients repeatedly refer to her as their personal fairy godmother for assisting them in turning their dreams into reality. I love it. Well, welcome to the show, Wendy. Oh, delighted to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, so I love, we were talking a little bit before we began and that we have so many common interests and we actually are serving many of the same clients. And I know that being a woman of value is an important thing to you. So if you can help us understand what what it does mean to you, that's the first question I ask everyone. First of all, I've been around for a while and I've seen a lot of changes. I turned 70 in May. And this is my, as you mentioned, this is my 40th year since I began my own business. And there were years prior to that. I started in business at a time where it wasn't really as common for women to be in executive positions. And I don't know if my brain just was wired differently, but I just never saw that as an issue. And what I am, one of my early seminars that I actually created, we decided to put in a segment called Women Working with Women. Because way back then, and it's still somewhat prevalent now, but thank goodness has changed significantly, women were not necessarily as supportive of each other as they are today. When I was in my early years of my career, I was mentored by men and I took on a lot of masculine qualities in that process. Now it worked until it didn't because as women, we have such amazing gifts that are really needed in this period of time. And so a woman of value is someone that recognizes their uniqueness. You know, my original business was called Thumbprints International because I believe each and every one of us, just like our thumbprint, is born with special gifts and talents that we need to cultivate so that we can make our special mark in life. And so in part, it's our job to discover those gifts. And a lot of times in early child development, more for women than men, we are trained to be other focused. And so we don't have as much feedback about who we are. I certainly wasn't. I I never knew 
who I really was. I didn't even know what I was good at because I had the kind of parent who everything had to be corrected. Everything was never good enough. And it it really took me a long time to develop my own self-worth, my self-esteem. So a woman of value knows their worth. They know their uniqueness. They know who they are and they're not willing to settle for anything else. And for many of us, that's a journey of discovery, of growth. It's not like we pop out and go, whoop, we're here. <laughs> um, and so, but, but to really discover. And once, you know, the nice thing that I personally appreciate about being 70 is I'm probably more in my skin in my life than ever before. You know, the things I used to worry about or be concerned about when I was younger are like, are you kidding me? You know, and if somebody doesn't like this, okay, that's fine. <laughs> I'm good with that too. So it's, it's, there's a level of self-love. There's a level of self-acceptance. And there's also, if you want to call it a level of I feel that so many women today are really being called to offer what their unique gifts and talents are, to make their mark, to live in a, to help our world in a day where women's values, women's qualities are very much needed. I agree with that. I, I like that you added that it's a journey because I think a lot of people listening will say, well, how do I do that? I don't know how to do that. How do I get from where I am to where she's talking about? It definitely is a journey. And I think that many of us grow up with similar backgrounds where we were number one, never good enough. And number two, we were raised to achieve and to only be valued for what we achieved and not who we were. And so when you ask somebody, what's your uniqueness, they don't even know because they haven't explored it. The tricky part about uniqueness and gifts is it's such a natural part of who you are that you don't necessarily recognize that it's something special because it's right. just, it's, it's, I can remember in graduate school being told by my professor, wow, you're just such an amazing, um, <laughs> what did he say? Uh, all of a sudden I just blanked, you know, <laughs> diagnostician. Mm. And I was like, I am, you know, and it's like, isn't everybody like that? You know, <laughs> and, and there were other things in that conversation, but nobody had ever said that to me. So, so that's why I think it's important sometimes to ask other people, what do you, what, what's special about me? What is it about me that you think is unique? And you will be amazed what they will tell you. Um, and, and that they think it's unique, you know, it's like, well, yeah, of course not. And they're like, no, <laughs> I'm not like that. So yes, I think that's yeah. the beauty of us coming together also. Yeah, I agree. And I think that, you know, often it's what comes naturally to us that we don't value because we think, well, yeah, can't everybody do that? I mean, I, I remember with art, that was my unique talent growing up. And I thought everybody could do what I did. You know, I would, I would show at a juried art show and I thought everybody wow. can do this. And, you know, it was just not, I didn't appreciate the uniqueness of it until much later. And yeah. it's also the beauty of getting older. I think I agree with you. I'm 65, you're 70. And it's like, living our best life and not caring what other people think, which is so different from being in your 20s and worrying about being seen, which is why often we become invisible and then we don't achieve to the best of our ability. But we'll get into, I really want to hear some of your methodology after we talk about kind of that pivotal moment when you stepped into your value, because you know you describe where you were, you describe where you are, fill in the blanks a little bit. How did you, how did you become this person? Yeah, well, it wasn't the easiest journey. Um, you know, my, my graduate work was in counseling psychology, postgraduate work was in management and organizational development. And I was on a fast track to success. I was doing very well. I started my own business in 1981. I was traveling all over the country. At that time, I 
was working, um, I was under contract with the Fortune 100 company and I was sick as a dog. And my little workaholic brain did not even compute, you know, maybe you shouldn't go on that trip. And so I'm at the Dallas Fort Worth airport and I went outside the airport. Obviously this, this is in 1990. So way before the restrictions that we had have today. And I went outside to get fresh air because I was sick to my stomach and I passed out and I fell over a ledge and I fell about 25 feet. Ooh. And the good news in some ways is I landed on my right leg. The bad news is I landed on my right leg. My right leg was shattered. Um, I had back fractures. I was actually much later diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury. Around week four, my former husband came suitcases packed saying he no longer wished to be married. And even though I take full responsibility for my portion that contributed to that decision, you might agree that the timing wasn't exactly optimal, not that it ever is. And the real true blow came when we went to court. My former husband um, is an attorney and he was awarded full custody of our son who was only four and a half at that time. And if there was anything that I loved, didn't, I, there was no thing or person that I loved more than being Adam's mom. And I broke into a lot of pieces at that point. I was already in a vulnerable place because of all my surgeries and everything else going on. And interestingly enough, it was my mom who suggested that I might want to learn how to meditate. And at that point in time, quieting my mind was a complete oxymoron. But, you know, desperate times, right? Because I even remember being in the hospital and just this question kept going around in my head. What choices had I made that got me here? And what choices am I gonna to have to start making to dig out of this very deep hole? And so when I started to learn how to meditate, I remember I found somebody, we, we would meet at this person's home, just a small group of us. And we had little places in their home that we did our thing. And I remember going to Michael, the person who was teaching us and saying, you know, it's really interesting. Every time I almost feel like my mind is going to relax, I get this urge to sing. And he just looked at me and said, well then sing. And I started to laugh. I said, you don't understand. <laughs> I actually have people in my life that request I not do that. And so he just kind of gave me a look and he said, you know, just see, give it a try. So I went back to my little place in the house, got into that space and I let this, what is, kind of a melodic type of singing come out of me. And for the first time in a very long time, not only did my mind begin to relax, but so did my body. And I was living in Dallas, Texas at that time. And what they say is kind of true. Things are a little bit bigger there, especially <laughs> I live in Southern California now, it's a little different. And um, I used to do my meditation and singing in my closet because of the, I loved how it felt. I loved the enclosure, I loved the acoustics. And it wasn't too long that I realized, I think this could be more than what I thought it was. And it wasn't too long after that, that I was back at this person's house and I'm walking down their hallway and I pass by another person in our class and out of my mouth comes, you have a block around your heart. And I'm thinking, well, where did that come from? And so I'm continuing to walk, you know, I'm kind of, it's like, what the hell was that, excuse me? And, and I'm walking down the hall and I hear the, the person's son who was a teen at the time, very gifted, um, was somewhere behind me. I hear him say the same thing to this guy. Hey, you got a block around your heart. And I'm thinking to myself, you need to know, I was a very traditional management consultant. My lane was executive and team development. It was not that. <laughs> so I started to play with it. 
And, you know, I started working with me and my friends and it didn't take me very long to see. I don't know if it was the accident, the brain injury, whatever that opened this up, but I'm able to see energy. I see where there's stuck points in people. I see where old hurts and traumas are still lodged creating that barrier to getting to where you want to be. And even though I was very self-conscious about it for quite some time, I knew I had been given a very special gift. And it was kind of like, Wendy, you're gonna have to get over this because what I love about this is I have worked with so many people now in a variety of ways and I can shorten that learning curve I can shorten the period of time from where they are to where they want to be because they don't have to figure it out. The process takes care of the inner work. There's a brain training component. And I think it was my journey through all of this that restored my confidence in life. It restored my confidence in God and opened up a whole world for me of energy and healing, I never, ever, if you would have asked me, little girl, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't think the word miracle worker would have ever been on a list of 100. Mm -hmm. And even how that got birthed was a very gradual process in itself. Because it's, to me, that's a very bold statement. You know, miraculous living, seriously? I would love to just have, you know, so I help restore hope. And the first place that it started was me. You know, after I lost custody of my son, I was devastated. I felt, um, but I was broken open. And, you know, my career probably masked a lot of underlying insecurities. You know, I think you mentioned, you know, a lot of people strive for a certain level of success and how we define that. Well, I started with a blank slate. And so because of that, I just very gradually, you know, kind of like the, the caterpillar turning to a butterfly, you know, just it was, it was a journey and it wasn't like a straight line. You know, I would I would poke my head out for a while and then, you know, maybe retreat more. But for today, even though I wish that the process in my case was a little bit easier, I'm so grateful because I can make it much easier for somebody else. Yeah. Wow. What a story. I, first of all, I'm not surprised that you develop this ability after your brain injury, because I know somebody else who developed the same skill set. Uh, this woman that I co-lead boundaries courses with, she had a brain injury and she's actually done a clearing on me where, um, you know, she sees things and she's, and she's been able to channel books just come out of her and like all this stuff that never happened before. So it's, it's pretty incredible. Like scientifically they've, they've done studies on brains after a brain injury. And for some people, like the, the brain waves are just going so fast. There's so much going on in there. And there's a, there's a lot of misunderstandings about what brain injuries are and how people can treat them. Um, but you know, you, you definitely had a, a huge challenge and you, you worked really hard to overcome it. I mean, I can just imagine the difference between being this an analytical, problem solving, <laughs> <laughs> got it all together analysis to tapping into right brain, um, you know, really being much more open and, you know, not controlling. Like there's just, it's like the polar opposite. But yeah, the, but obviously they, this but was they, in you. But they work very well together today. Yeah. So tell us, tell us a little bit more about that because, you know, the work I do is, is also a hybrid of lots of different methodologies because I don't believe that we can know a person just by analyzing what happened to them in the past or using a tried and true method that somebody else created. 
for me, it's like a little neuro-linguistic programming, a little coaching, a little nonviolent communication, a little behavioral therapy, a little intuition, a little creativity. So tell us what your program, like, you know, how, how it all works. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm a do what works kind of girl. In fact, that was my graduate thesis. You know, um, they wanted me to proclaim what my theory of psychology was. And I went, well, here you go. <laughs> and, and so when I work with people, I come into your world. I want to really wake up and dial up your deepest desires. So one of the first places we start is what I refer to as magic wand time. And, and I, have, I do have a structure in which I take people through because not only do I, not only do I do sound healing when I work with people and work with their energy, but I also channeled um, transformational healing cards. They're like designs that also hold a frequency to them that's energetically very healing. And so I use the cards also as part of the process when we do magic wand time, because I believe the desires of the heart are pointing you in the direction of your truth. And it's my job to make sure that you're living that. And, and then, yes, then I start working with people kind of like they're, they're like this very complex Rubik's cube that has gotten out of alignment. And so we're working to bring them back into alignment because once you're in alignment and another part that's very unique about my system involves a brain training aspect. So there are many wonderful practitioners and processes that do release work. However, not as many work with the brain to strengthen it so that you're either strengthening existing neural pathways that's talking in a way that works or creating new ones so that you are, so your brain and your desire is now working together and you're not creating the distractions or what I call the mischief that keep you from actually achieving what it is and experiencing what you desire. So then it does get into action. You know, it's not like this is just, oh, let's do this. But my clients will work with the system in between our time together. And because, as I mentioned, that brain training part of it is very important. I don't want people to risk defaulting back into old patterns which happens a lot, just using release work. So even that turned out really, really good. And then we look at what I refer to as inspired action. And inspired action is, yes, I definitely know what my next step is. Doesn't mean that that next step may be easy, but you just know you have to take it. And instead of making that huge to-do list, you know, I just was interview I was just interviewing somebody just yesterday who has never done marketing has never done a lot of things that are being suggested today they just decided oh I'm going to do this she believed in her body of work she started giving away a few sessions and then she kept getting referrals and now over 40 I'm sorry over 50,000 clients later <laughs> you know she's doing pretty well yeah. I'll so, say. so um, it it really depends again on who the person is, where they are, what they may need, and obviously, when I work with somebody, whether it's individually or in a group, you know, there is an accountability factor that really does help. Okay. And every and I have the ability that I see people's brilliance. I see them successful. When I was younger when I was really younger, I've always had that gift. I didn't know that's what it was. Like I would meet boys and I would see their potential. Well, you don't want to date a potential that may or may <laughs> not happen. Not a good okay. idea. And so, so I do, I'm able to see and I'm able to hear and know people's truth. So when we're talking, it's like, mm, 
I'm not so sure that let's let's look at that. That that doesn't feel quite right. So I just really help people stay on track. And what I love, love, love is, you know, like you, I've helped people attract love, which I know we're not supposed to have favorite children, but it's one of mine. <laughs> it's just so much fun. And and I've obviously I've helped business owners grow their business, make more money. I help people raise their financial set point. Every single person I've ever worked with is restricted to some extent in their ability to receive. So we we open that up as well. We dial up your what I refer to as your attraction factor and your magnetizer. And there are different variables that can help position you for success. And I've also worked with kids with learning disabilities and, and women that have been abused. And in an extremely short period of time, they are freed from that past trauma and they're able to move forward in their life. And I could give you lots of other examples, but, but it's, it's just looking at where they are, what their vision for the future is, what their mission is. I always want to know the higher meaning and purpose of why do you want this? Because let's face it, all of us at some point in time will wake up in the morning and go, uh, really? And it's the mission and purpose that drives us forward and go, yeah, I know. Okay, fine. <laughs> let's get this party started. Yeah, wow. Um it sounds like a great method and a successful method because you have accountability, you have inspiration, you are creating new neural pathways or strengthening the ones we have. And we often think, oh, our brains are older, we can't learn new things. And it's so not true. It is we so have, not true. <laughs> yeah, those bridges, even though they're hard, you know, we just take a different path. And it's incredible because I've worked with an older audience and I have clients who are in their late 60s, early 70s. And they say, can you help me? And I say, yeah, <laughs> because, course. you know, it's like I never found anybody who could help me. It's like that's such a sad thing that so many people go through life without somebody really tuning in to who they are and what they need. And once you get it, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I, uh, you know, when yeah. I when I started to write my last book, Create Your Miraculous Life, it actually was it really started out. It's never too late mm. because I was 69. This was last year. We were in the midst of a pandemic. There's so much more that I want to be experiencing in my life. And especially given the pandemic, I thought, how many people are wondering What's going to happen to them? You know, is it too late for love or starting a business or being able to retire someday and financial issues and all of that? And quite honestly, and I felt this inner pull that the time was to write this. And as I, I and on top of that, it was when I was talking to my publisher who happens to be my best friend. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, it just doesn't seem like it's significant, you know, it's not complete to write a book, it's never too late. And she was the one that said, Wendy, what's the name of your business? <laughs> you know, what was the name of your first book? And my first book actually created the whole theme of miraculous living. And there's a story behind that as well. And, and it really just positioned me, she said, it's about miraculous living. Well, given the pandemic, given my son's health, my life was feeling very um, miraculous. But you know, it, I always seem to put myself in these positions and it's like, who else is sitting around feeling that their life is very um, miraculous? And what I appreciated about the experience was I too had to dig deep and I had to find that place of hope and trust and other things. And, you know, for any of us that are struggling, you know, when we start talking to other people and, and supporting them, you know, and even just the interviews that I did for the book was like, oh yeah, right. Okay. I can't, you know, it was helping to uplift me 
and out came the book. That's wonderful. I think we often don't realize who needs to hear our message, who needs to read. And it goes back to what you said at the beginning about our uniqueness and what's our gift. You know, if, if, if it helps us, great, but it helps my friend, okay. <laughs> I, I read a book many years ago that was written by somebody from India, and it was about the Indian culture. And it was about caste differences. And she thought people who grew up in India will understand this book. This became one of the most best-selling novels because the themes in the book were universal. And everybody can relate to feeling less than. Everyone can relate to how do we treat other people? How do we struggle in life? doesn't matter what your perspective is and people need to have the gifts that you are sharing. And so you followed your own advice and wrote the book. And I love the publisher's suggestion. Often we don't see those things when they're right in front of us. My, my podcast, Last First Date Radio, used to be called Courageous Conversations. And because they were, and I loved the name. And I was talking to a marketing expert and she said, the name of your business is Last First Date. Like, why are you not calling it that? <laughs> it was the same kind of conversation. I was like, oh, duh. So yeah, um, but this is, this is a beautiful title and we do need, we need inspiration now more than ever. People were so suffering and alone and feeling like, like they were more alone than anybody else. And I, I think that um, many people came to me for support during COVID because they just were at the end of the rope. And I started courses, I wrote a book as well. Um, I finally published my book, which is um, how to, it's called Becoming a Woman of Value, here's my book, um, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And so it really is, the culmination of so much of what I learned in life. And I think that we, we don't realize again, like we, not only we went through something, but the ability to curate that knowledge and share it with others is not common. And so I, you know, congratulations on getting it out and doing it and sharing it with so many people. Yeah, it felt, it felt pretty bold. And, yeah. and I actually, I'm a fairly humble person, you know, I've lived a very blessed life, but I don't have a very strong ego. And, and so I'm like, but miraculous living. And, you know, the other thing, just like my healing gifts, um, I was guided to be a voice for the belief in miracles and creating a miraculous life. And I feel that it was an assignment given to me. And I've always been one to say yes to assignments. And especially who I was given an assignment from, I'm like, okay, fine. And, <laughs> Yay, I'll do and it. It's, <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, and it, it's, um, it's humbling in many ways. It's, it's a blessing, it's an honor. And like you said, if I can just help someone else live a life of peace and health, and happiness, my job has been, my job has been accomplished. Oh, that's beautiful. So let's let's go to the lightning round and and do some rapid fire questions. Okay. The first one is a fill in the blank. I used to think I wasn't blank enough. Oh, I didn't think I was good enough, smart enough, pretty enough. <laughs> um, that's a good start. <laughs> that's those are pretty pretty basic. What was the number one thing that was holding you back from becoming a woman of value? Me. <laughs> um, I, I really did not know who I was. I did not have a very good sense of my identity. Um, I was always defined by my mom. Um, and I never learned for a long time how to tap into me. And so, um, so I tend, I had the, more of a tendency to listen to other people's opinions and, and not my own. Yeah, which you can't have an identity if everybody else is, is responsible for it, right? Um, very true. Before we ask the next question, I, I just, I had a question before that I forgot to ask you, which is how's your son doing? Oh, 
thank you. He's doing really well. Um, we're, I, I like to say that I'm cautiously optimistic. Oh, um, it's still gonna be a journey for him, I think. Um, but, oh, he's doing so much better. Thank you. Oh, good. And by and the way, um, it actually worked out for us even losing custody. My son was such a sport. He taught me more about unconditional love than any other human being because we went from one home to two homes to two cities to two states mm. and he never flinched and either I was going there he was coming to me and and he ultimately did come and live with me his senior year in high school mm. and since then we've not lived terribly far apart from each other oh, that's wonderful yeah my, my children chose to live with me full time as well. We had shared joint custody, but they on their own really wanted to be in a home that felt safer to them emotionally. And I think when a kid can make that choice, it's so much better than fighting over your kid and making them feel terrible and having the parent alienate them from the mom. I mean, there's just so much stuff that happens. So that's a, that's a wonderful ending to, to the custody battle, because, you know, a lot of people don't have that, you know, they don't have that relationship. I, I have many women in my practice who are struggling with their kids being alienated by the father. You know, I, um, I take a higher view of that. And you're talking to somebody who really lost out on a lot of her child's life. And I had to trust um, my son's journey. And um, I knew basically he was safe. He ended up having um, a stepmother who wasn't very kind to him. Um, and this, you know, and Adam and I were in enough communication with each other that it wasn't until close to when he moved with me that I really got concerned. Uh, and, and so I think again, instead of fight, I don't believe in fighting over it. I mean, if there's a safety issue, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm not saying this, this is in every instance, but I think the more we can accept, the more we can support. You know, when Adam was with his father, that's his life. And I had to have trust that he was at least safe. And so my bar was pretty low. And then when he was with me, then we lived and communicated a certain way. And I knew that he was seeing some contrast and eventually he was gonna make choices of how he was gonna live his life. Yeah. And so I have a lot of compassion too for people going through that. But I think we really have to look at what's what is in the best interests of our children. I agree. And having trust in our children and not trying to force an outcome because forcing is a is pushing energy and it pushes people away usually. I know. Um, I yeah. agree. And it's hard. You know, yeah. I, I've said to people, listen, these are the same people that you at one time, your hormones were in overdrive, you lost sleep over this person, and your journey has now completed. So the gift of that relationship has been your child or children. Yeah. Yeah. And, and be you grateful have to accept for that. that. Yeah, it's true. I've talked to so many parents who want to control how their kids think their choices and their adults already. And I say, you know, your job for that is over. <laughs> it's, <laughs> you know, you need to trust that your child, when something is important to that child, who's now an adult, they make those things happen. And just because you see a different outcome or a different future for them that you think is better, that doesn't mean that that's what they want or that's what they're ready for. So it's so much of it is just putting your ego aside. You mentioned ego before. It's that's nine tenths of all this is like, it's not about you. It's about yeah. them. Yes. And I think a lot of times, especially in families of divorce, um, a lot of people, a lot of parents understandably put a lot into their children and they haven't put as much into themselves. Yeah. And so as their children, 
individuate, as they begin to grow into their person, you suddenly the, the parents going, uh-oh, and they want to hold on to that. And it's not healthy for either one. No. And and so, yeah, there's a there's a lot of shall we say there's a lot of opportunity there. Yes, this is a whole other podcast. So let's get back to get back to the lightning round because I mean it's a it's a great topic. It's definitely worth exploring more. Um, so let's get to the the next question, which is what is the best advice that you can give a woman who wants to become more empowered? some simple steps to begin to take if you're not already doing that is have a morning practice of gratitude. Start to really notice, value, and appreciate the good in your life. In my work, worst and darkest days, I've been practicing gratitude forever. And and some days it was like, I am grateful I have a roof over my head. I'm grateful my heart's beating. I'm grateful my lungs are working. And, and to just try to find that. Um, and to also do things that say, I love me. So if that means you get up a little earlier and you go for a walk, or if you live in an environment that you can go to a gym. I, I have a tiny little gym I get to go to now. We just started recently. And to take care of yourself, you know, to nourish yourself in a variety of ways. And when I say nourish, yes, of course, I'm talking about nourishing yourself through healthy food choices um, most of the time. Um, but also to spend time in quiet or taking a bath or playing some soothing, beautiful music, or if you can, to get a massage, whatever that is for you that nourishes you. And, and as you begin to fill up, then you can start looking at, well, what else can I do? What else do I need? And be willing to ask for support. Support is not a four letter word. And you know, I, I still reach out to people today for guidance, you know, if I have something going on. And as I've already said, I've been, I've been living on this earth and doing what I'm doing for a very long time. It doesn't stop. It's great. And I love reaching out. And the truth of the matter is, my friends or whoever I'm reaching out to, they love it too. Yeah. You know, doesn't it feel wonderful when somebody calls you up and say, you know, I'm really having a yucky moment. Can you help me? That's my technological term. <laughs> and and it's, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, doesn't it feel wonderful to be able to help somebody? Well, why would you think if you're the one that's in need, why would you want to perform to, 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 why would you want to deprive them of that experience? Yeah. I think when people are givers and don't ask for support, they are so uncomfortable with asking and often they're martyrs. They're not just givers and it's uncomfortable. It feels vulnerable. And so much of what you've shared today is about vulnerability. It's sharing the hard stuff. It's not, we're not perfect beings who are you know, the way that you were raised to always be perfect and it has to be better, that's not real. That's not your authentic self. And so that's what takes us away from who we really are. And asking for support in that vulnerable way where not only are you giving yourself a gift, you're giving a gift to the person who gives. And I think when a giver hears that, that you're actually giving a gift to someone else, that's to shift the brain a little bit, <laughs> the mindset. You know, so when it's... Adam was young, mm. my son had these little Buddha moments, you know, <laughs> where it's like, who's the parent and who's the child? <laughs> and one of the things that Adam said to me when he was just a little guy, he, I remember he looks up at me and goes, you know, mom, there's no such thing as perfect, but everyone's perfect just the way they are. Wow. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> who are you? <laughs> Who are you? Oh my gosh. But it's so, that is a wise statement. Yeah. And I think we have to learn to be kinder to ourselves. 
to be able to accept our humanness. I don't even like to say imperfections. It's just the human experience and how wonderful that we get a myriad of emotions. You know, I, I never, one of my girlfriends used to say, you are the best crier I have ever met. And I'm like, I never thought that was going to be my claim to fame. <laughs> but I never was willing to try to squash this end of the spectrum. Because if I did, I also risked not being able to experience this end of the spectrum. Yeah. So true. I just had a an amazing experience visiting my grandchildren in Israel. They, they live really far away. And I have three little ones, seven, four, and one and a half. And the seven-year-old, the day I was leaving, she started to cry. And I said, what's, what's going on? She goes, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you. And I said, you never have to be embarrassed to tell me anything. So she whispered in my ear that she was really sad that I was leaving. And I said... I am so glad that you can express your emotions. I said, that is your superpower. And she goes, I don't have a cape. That's not real. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I didn't say you're a superhero. I said, it's your superpower. I said, please don't ever lose the ability to express all those feelings because it's so special for you to do it. So, you know, we need people in our lives who validate that having emotions is is good and it's special and it's real and it makes us who we are absolutely you know a lot of people including me we're not allowed to express ourselves emotionally or otherwise and um and it took and for me eventually you know when you have certain feelings and emotions that are held down you know think of your emotion like a beach ball and you're holding it down. Well, to hold a beach ball down underwater takes effort. But when you express it, it's, it's light. Yeah. And, and to give yourself, and what a gift to give your granddaughter, that gift of expression is phenomenal because especially for women more than men, although men have their issues as well, um, we, we are able to identify our emotions more easily. We're able to actually express our emotions more easily. And we have to train ourselves because many of us were taught, no, we don't do that. Yeah, man up. Right. Yeah. Woman <laughs> up. <laughs> okay, a few more questions and we're gonna wrap. Okay. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self? I want you to pay attention and trust yourself more. You're brilliant, you're special, and you are gonna be going on and doing some wonderful things. So enjoy this. Know that you are really special despite what anybody is trying to tell you. Love it. What is something that people get wrong about you? I don't know that it's true as much now, but some people used to think I was a snob because I was quiet. Um, I am still, even though I'm very public <clears throat> in my professional life, I don't have a need to be at the center of anything. And I like listening to people. So <clears throat> I think that, and I have very good posture. So some people might think I'm a little aloof. And <clears throat> excuse me, actually, um, there's still, a, I can't say that I'm shy. Um, but in certain circumstances, I don't, you know, I, I don't try to force myself into anything. We were just recently with my sweetheart's um, group of high school pals. So I was the new kid on the block. And, and so, and he was really concerned because he said, you're not talking that much. I said, it's just, don't worry. I, if, Eventually, if that happens, I'm good. I'm not worried. I totally understand all of that because I'm very similar. I think that, you know, when you have that kind of, um, it's not just being an introvert and being, it's, it's being introspective, I think, that um, when you come into new situations and you're not just 
speaking to be to, to be heard but you're sussing out your situation and trying to see like I don't want to just have small talk for the sake of having small talk it's it's I know for myself I I want to have meaningful conversations which is why I do two podcasts <laughs> I love having deep conversations with people so you know just talking for talking's sake before you really know someone can feel kind of eh. And quite honestly, when I meet people, I like asking questions. So, um, yeah. so it's just the way it is. Actually, I consider myself a situational extrovert. Mm. I love being with people until I don't, yeah. and then I need to, <laughs> I need to replenish by myself. Um, well, that's but, that's the definition of an introvert. <laughs> I because introverts can be public speakers. Uh, you know, many presidents have been introverts it's how you how you replenish and recharge yeah and yeah i mean being with people is great but an extrovert recharges with people i recharge in quiet me too <laughs> <laughs> when i was with my my daughter and grandchildren i had my own apartment this time and so i would say all right i'm going to go back to the apartment now <laughs> it would be like i'm saturated i'll come back when i when i've recharged and it's that kind of self-care, because you were talking before about self-care, that's another part of self-care. It's like, know when you need to recharge. Know when you have not, you know, when you're just out of out of juice. Because yeah. when you take care of yourself in that way, it helps everyone else around you. All right, so final question. Okay. <laughs> it's a big one. How would you like to be remembered? Oh, that is a big one. Well, first of all, I think I would like to be remembered for somebody that really cared and um, that would do anything and everything for her family and friends. And if you would ask them today, they already know that. And that I really was able to make a difference in the lives of others. You know, that my purpose is assisting others to fulfill theirs what I refer to as their divine destiny. And that is what I want to be remembered for. Beautiful. So this has just been a, a wonderful conversation, Wendy. Um, I would love for you to share how people can find you and purchase your books and learn more about you. Well, first of all, the book can be found on Amazon and um, it's Create Your Miraculous Life. It's never too late. And my first book is The Miracle That Is Your Life. Um, and then wendydarling.com is my website. Um, I have another one for my corporate business, which is Go the Distance Consulting, GTD Consulting. And on my website, there are ways that you can reach out for us to have a heart to heart. If you were interested in that, you'll see some things that I offer. There's an RQ assessment, there's an audio it's a way to get on my email list. By the way, in my book, there is a link for um, the, ARC, um, the results accelerator assessment that if you focus this, it'll help you get to your result easier and faster. Mm. So there are, and there's also a special offer in there as well. Wonderful. Well, all of this will be in the show notes as well. Thank you so much, Wendy, for coming on the show and personifying a woman of value, then inspiring our audience to step into their value. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a delightful experience. I really appreciate it. If you would like to step more fully into your value, grab a free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Becoming a Woman of Value on my website, thewomanofvalue.com. Just click the link at the top of the homepage. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to click the subscribe button in your listening app. And if there's something in this episode that inspired you, please share it with others. Because the more we share these inspirational stories, the more women of value we will have in this world. I'll see you next time.